What's up, Internet? My name's Ian Bloom. Welcome to another different episode of Nerd Finance. I don't plan on continuing to read you guys' PowerPoint presentations on things while I talk as a little picture up here in the corner, but as it turns out, I feel like this is the best way to disseminate information, and legislation in the finance industry is changing a lot and very quickly during this period of time as the federal government tries to respond to what is, you know, a generational defining crisis. So I want to focus for a few moments on the CARES Act. The CARES Act is a monumental piece of legislation that was signed into office last Friday. Um, so it exists, it is out there, and it is that thing that is supposed to send you $1,200. But there are a lot of other changes in it, and so I want to make sure that we address those piece by piece. Some of these changes are not specifically within the CARES Act, but interact with the CARES Act, like student loan interest. So while I may be covering some legislation that isn't specifically in the CARES Act, it is related. Just keep that in mind. On that note, here's a quick disclosure. Uh, I am not a lawyer. As with my last video, I am just trying to simplify some of the difficult terminology out there for everybody who's a viewer. So keep in mind that while I am doing my best here, you should not make any changes without consulting your financial planner on top of legal counsel if it's a very specific legislative thing. What we're going to cover today are those checks you've heard about, some changes to unemployment law, some changes to student loans, also some changes to um, businesses and retirement accounts and some miscellaneous changes. And then I will summarize with some final thoughts from myself. Um, I think that there's a lot to cover here, but I tried to boil it down to just a couple of sentences because ultimately we could talk about the details all day long because it's a 330 page bill, but I think that we can probably get this down to the things that personally affect you as an individual. So when do you get your check? <laughs> so first of all, let's talk about the checks. They're supposed to be $1,200 per adult allocated and $500 per child. This is a popular piece of the legislation to talk about because it affects a lot of people. The first question you have to ask yourself is how much money did you earn the last time you filed your taxes? So assuming you filed your taxes in 2018, use those numbers, or if you filed your taxes, or rather if the last tax return that you filed as the date of the calculation, which we don't know yet, was for 2019, use those numbers. And the key is what's called AGI or adjusted gross income. So it's not the total amount of income you earned that year. It's the amount of income you earned minus the tax deductions you got. So 7,500 for individuals or, um, or I'm sorry, 75,000 for individuals or 150,000 for couples. Um, and couples under legal definition are those who are married. So if you are living together but not married, um, it would be 7,500 for each of you on your separate tax returns. The next question I want to ask you is, did you set up a direct deposit account with the IRS when you filed last time, whether that was to receive a refund or to pay them money that you owed? If it came directly out of your bank account, that's a good thing. That will be the account that they will attempt to deposit your check into, so it will expedite the process. Now, an obvious question is, what if that account is no longer a bank account I use? People change bank accounts all the time, right? And uh, you should not at any point be expected to keep your bank account for the rest of your life. What if that bank doesn't treat you well? Um, so what if that does happen? Well, they will attempt to deposit the money into the account and then because they will find out that the account is closed, they will then send you a letter with a phone number to call. I do not envy the people who will be on the other lines of those telephones. Yes, they will have jobs, but it'll be a difficult job when people call them looking for their money. So the third question I have to ask you is how patient are you really? Um, in the past attempts at this, it has taken months for the IRS to get the money out, but the law specifies that the IRS needs to get this money out as soon as possible. So we'll see. The financial infrastructure in the country is a lot more developed than it has been in the past from a digital perspective. So hopefully some of this money gets flowing out soon, but especially if you don't have a direct deposit account on file with the IRS, it could be two, maybe three months before you see this check. So 
don't start spending it today. <laughs> So let's move on to some changes to unemployment law. Um, the federal government added $600 per week for four months to unemployment benefits. And technically your state may or may not have taken this. Now, I think that almost all states are going to accept this additional aid because it would be silly for them to turn it away and have their citizens yell at them. But um, you will wanna check with your state on that. It eliminates the waiting period for these unemployment benefits, provides a 13 week extension on state granted unemployment benefits, and the federal government is also providing funds to incentivize the creation of state short time benefits. What I mean by that is, if you are suffering from less pay, but not no pay as a result of the change in your work environment, you are entitled to some amount of unemployment insurance, assuming your state provides it. Now, the federal government is helping some states who didn't have those types of benefits provide them now, but we'll see if those are created. On the big $600 per week edition, uh, that is only, I believe, for those who have full unemployment benefits. So it's not applying to those with short time. And eliminating the waiting for unemployment benefits does not mean that you will get your check immediately the day that you file, but it does mean that you don't have to wait until you don't recognize income to file. If you get laid off and you're still waiting on your next check to come in next week, then you can already file for the unemployment benefits that you're expecting to be able to receive. Oh, and here I was wrong. This law is pretty complicated actually, so I took a minute to go ahead and look up the specific ruling on that $600 per week for four months. Um, it actually does imply to short time benefits, but it's only in the amount of $300 per week. So you do get that additional supplement, it just does not count for the full amount. Um, they call this work sharing in the law or in the waysandmeans.gov website. So. That are That is a summary of the changes to unemployment. Essentially, the federal government is adding more money to unemployment benefits. It's hoping to get the money in your pocket faster. It is giving you um, a maximum duration extension on your state unemployment benefits. And they're trying to get work sharing or short time benefits into every state so that employees don't suffer from just having reduced wages, not necessarily no wages. So student loan changes. Student loan changes are a little bit interesting. Um, federal student loans were already not going to accrue interest for a while. But now federal student loan payments are also not required, but must be suspended by calling your loan servicer. What this means is that if you're already set up to automatically pay your student loans, you have to actually get involved and contact your loan servicer to get them to cancel that automatic payment. They will not not take your money if it's offered basically, but they are not requiring that you make payments in order to not accrue interest or be in default. And September 30th of 2020 is the next time payments will be required. These are only, and I want to emphasize this again, even though it's written twice here, for federal student loans. Private student loans have no new legislation applied to them, unfortunately. Retirement account changes. Coronavirus distributions are now allowed. Coronavirus distributions are interesting because if you call your 401k provider and say, I have been adversely affected by the coronavirus, I need my money, they are not allowed to contest you on that. You don't have to prove to them that you have been adversely affected. If somebody were to come audit you, you would have to be able to prove to them that you are adversely affected, but the likelihood of that is very slim. Um, these distributions waive all penalties and can be paid back over three years. Um, and then if you don't pay them back, the taxes from that income are spread over the next three years. Loans on 401ks are also allowed up to 100% of your balance within the 401k or 100,000 are the two maximums and the repayments are delayed for one year. And then required minimum distributions are suspended for 2020 which means that if you are somebody receiving required minimum distributions, you are not required to take them out of your account in 2020. You still may, but are not required to. Um, this includes, by the way, beneficiary IRAs. So IRAs that you have inherited. Some miscellaneous changes. Um, health savings accounts and uh, flex save. 
flexible spending accounts have uh, allowed expenses within the healthcare space that have been expanded. They now include feminine care products such as tampons and those sorts of things and over-the-counter medications. Finally, I think this is a really necessary change to what HSAs can be used for, but it's really interesting that they decided to sneak it into this particular bill. Um, Medicare beneficiaries can request up to 90 days of medications up front for this period of time to minimize the amount of outings that they have to take, which is probably very helpful for those folks because they can bulk up and stock up on their medication and therefore not be required to go out every month to get a new supply. A $300 tax deduction was added above the line for charitable contributions. This means that even people who are taking the standard deduction, which is like 90% of Americans at this point, can still receive benefit from donating cash to charity. But it just removes $300 from your AGI at the end of the year. Businesses have also received a ton of changes, and I'm just going to summarize three of the bigger ones here. Um, most of my viewership is not comprised of business owners. So for those of you who are business owners, I suggest you go look at the rule a little more expansively and do your research. But first, the big one is the Paycheck Protection Program. These are forgivable loans guaranteed by the SBA, Small Business Association, the max interest rate of 4%, um, a max repayment period of 10 years, but most of them are coming in at two. Uh, they are forgivable if the same number of employees are maintained and the money is spent on operating costs in specific categories of the business. What I mean by that is they are telling you that within the first eight months of receiving the loan, you must spend the loan principal on rent or your mortgage interest, on your business space, payroll, health benefits, and some other specific categories that are included there. This is important because the value of this forgivable loan is that if you spend it only on those things, then you don't have to pay the loan back in theory. So make sure that you are paying attention to where you are allocating these dollars. The employee retention credit is a tax credit available to businesses with significant re revenue drops. Specifically, you have to have a quarter in which your revenue was 50% lower than the equivalent quarter the year before. So basically, if your January to March was 50% lower than last year's January to March, you are now going to be able to receive this credit. It is then applicable to each quarter in which you have less than 80% of your revenue in 2020 um, from the prior year quarters. And the credit's equal to 50% of the employee's wages. Uh, employers are permitted to defer their 2020 payroll tax, including those who are self-employed like myself, which is nice. It means that you don't have to pay your payroll tax right at the end of this year. You can spread it over multiple years. Spreading taxes is always something that I prefer because that way I don't have to pay up front. But that's it for businesses. Like I said, this is mostly an individual's video, so sorry, business owners. So some closing thoughts. This bill does help, but maybe not enough. Um, it's really interesting to be in a position where the federal government is willing to help you out somewhat financially, but not all the way. Um, applying for unemployment and getting that extra $600 a week is going to be super, super helpful, but we have no idea how long the coronavirus is going to be something that changes the American way of life. And if it goes on for longer than that four months, we could be facing new legislation or a new problem to then solve. Additionally, the $1,200 checks are nice, but $1,200 is about a month of expenses in most areas. Um, it, it, so depending on what kind of lifestyle you live and stuff, it may be everything to you or it may be nothing to you. And um, just accept your $1,200 and, and move on with it. Um, do what you can and try resisting hurting your future finances as much as possible. This means try not to run up credit card debt, eating out all the time, you know, buy your groceries, even though it's sometimes difficult to do that. Um, also try not to rip all the money out of your future retirement dollars and pull it into cash to have a cash surplus right now. If you need it, access it. That's what it's there for. Um, that's the whole point of these coronavirus distributions, but make sure not to use that money if you don't need it because the future you will be really upset if they don't have any money to spend when they can no longer work. Um, some of the small like additional changes that were added in like the HSA uh, expense definition expansion 
are nice, frankly. Like, uh, feminine care products and over-the-counter medications both should have been covered by HSAs, in my opinion, the whole time. It's not as if either of those products are not necessary for the health of the individual, and a health savings account is there to provide for the health of the individual. That's kind of the whole point. So those are my main thoughts about the bill, um, but also make sure to be informed. If you have questions about the bill, if there's anything that kind of seems wishy-washy to you or maybe I did not do a good job explaining it because I kind of ramble in these videos, make sure to do your research. You can also email me with questions or book an appointment at openworldfp.youcanbook.me. That is my firm calendar where I book clients and you're welcome to book a 30 minute or 60 minute appointment there just to get your questions answered and figure out whether there's additional work that needs to be done. Um, so that's kind of it for me today. I hope that this summary was helpful. Basically, the CARES Act touches everything in the American financial system at least a little bit. And I tried to summarize the changes that were relevant to individuals, though I may not have done a complete job. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, again, email me or comment down in the video. Talk to you soon.